everybody, it's Robert Taylor again here with the American Classic Heritage Show, and we're in for a real treat today. We have found Santa Claus, and he's uh, really Ray Bash, alias Santa Claus, but you know, you wonder a lot what he does in the summertime, and he's riding around in this old Model A Ford, if you can believe that. Him and his wife, they have a great time riding in this car. We're real pleased to have him come today to show it to us. So here we go, Ray, tell us all about this fine automobile you've got, please. Thank you, Robert, for that fine introduction. Again, my name is Ray Besh, and this is a 1931 Deluxe Coupe. Uh, they had a standard coupe and a Deluxe in 31. Uh, the Deluxe was just had a few extra items that uh, dressed up the car a little bit. It had cow lights, some wood graining on the interior, a dome light, and uh, just a few little features like that. Now, this car is pretty well dressed. Uh, as far as accessories that you could get from Ford Motor Company and a few other items. Uh, the Model A was built from 1928 to 1931. The 28 and the 29 are one body series and the 3031 are another body series. The 31 has a little more modern look to it than the earlier ones, uh, but basically the engine, transmission, and, and mechanics of it are the same. It's a four-cylinder, 40-horsepower motor has four-wheel brakes, similar to what you drove all the way up into the 1960s and so before they put disc brakes on cars. It's uh, three-speed manual transmission, non-synchronized, and it has wire wheels, tires with tubes that are getting a little bit harder to find, but we can always find them. There's various tread features uh, on the cars. Most of them came with Firestone tires, and most of the bulbs were Edison bulbs. Uh, Edison, Henry, Ford, and Firestone were very good friends. There's a lot of stories about them traveling around the country in Model T's and Model A's. This car uh, originated uh, and sold in California, was brought into Georgia by a friend of mine. He started a restoration. Uh, just ran out of time and interest, and I picked up the project and finished it. That was about 12 years ago or more. Took about two years to finish the car. Everything was done to it. It was taken completely apart and reassembled. Everything was repaired, replaced, or somehow renovated to work. I've stayed pretty much with the major features that Henry Ford has had. I found typically when I deviate from Henry's original plan, I liked his plan better than some of the modern features. So we've stayed pretty much with that. Have added a couple things, a little more compression to the motor with a high compression head. It's got what they called in the early years a police head because it only came on the police car, but it boosted the compression from 4.1 to 6.1. The cooling system on these cars is very simple. Air blows into the radiator, there's a fan on the inside that assists to pull air through, and then the hot air that's in the compartment has to be evacuated. So you have louvers here, and this is designed to actually let the heat out of the engine compartment. There's also pans between the frame and the motor that help do that very same thing. Very efficient system. If you're having trouble with your car overheating, it's because something's wrong. Your water pump, your radiator's not good, or you're not circulating right. This is the basic engine. It's a flathead motor. The valves are in the block rather than in the head. This is the heater I talked about. It's a bolt-on item over the exhaust manifold. It's the carburetor. Gravity fed, this is the fuel filter here. It's called a sediment bowl. As the gas flows out of the gas tank, across this, it allows heavy particles, like might be dirt or rust, to drop down, and then the cleaner gas will continue to flow into the carburetor. In the 30s, the gas was very dirty. It's not like today, it wasn't filtered, and you really were, were not at all sure about octane and things of that nature. Today, people are adding additives and doing all kinds of things to it, Truth of the matter is, the oil we used in the 30s, the gas we used was really, by today's standards, pretty, pretty poor and not filtered at all. All right, I use a standard motor oil in the car, buy it at any parts store, much like you'd use in a modern car. Gasoline, I run a little bit more octane than you might think. I run medium grade octane, but it'll run fine off of low octane. And they used to say in the old days, if you couldn't get gasoline, you could just adjust a few things and run this car off of kerosene, and I think that's very true. Cooling system is a two-blade fan, single fan belt. The exhaust system is a single tube going down to one side. 
This is the distributor. It looks a little bit different than normal. These are spark plugs in here. These spark plugs are actually 80 years old. You can take them apart, clean them, put them back on, and use them for years and years and years. You can put modern spark plugs in it. They do make replacements for them. They can get a little bit expensive if you want the look. These, I wanted the appearance of the original car, so that's why I use these. See, the spark plug wires are actually just a copper strap. Very simple, has a coil, runs into the here, points in a condenser in the distributor, just like you had all the way through the 60s, maybe the 70s in the cars. Later, things went to modernized transistor ignitions and things that you can actually fit on these cars. But again, I found Henry's way was probably the best way to go because I like it, I can adjust it, I understand it, don't have to worry about it. This is a vacuum line. It's used on this car to use an electric fan that I have inside that I use as a defroster when it's really rainy and high humidity. But it was intended for windshield wipers. Most of the cars had vacuum windshield wipers. This car actually came from the factory with an electric wiper. There were a few models that had electric wipers on them. Worked better because the vacuum, if you ever drove a car like this, when you accelerate, the vacuum drops and your wiper quits. So when you're driving along and it's raining and you come up on a hill, you've got no windshield wipers. This is the gas line. Actually, I have this gas line covered. It's just a simple steel line. The reason I have a cover on it is when I've driven this in very, very hot weather, I had has, has a tendency to vapor lock. That's where the gasoline actually gets too hot and boils in the line and it doesn't flow. You have to stop and let it cool off. This is just a little bit of insulation. We found this when we were on the road, we bought a piece of tubing and just cut it, put it on here and it helped immensely. A lot of stories about you could put old wooden clothespins on the line, you could wrap it in tin foil, a lot of different ways to do the same thing. But the item was that you're getting heat from here. If it's drafting across this line in this area here, it gets hot. You stop your car or it stops for you and you feel that line, if it's warm or hot, that's your problem. Just let it cool off and you'll be fine. You go on down the road. The carburetor, again, is an updraft carburetor. Air sucked in through here and notice there's no air filter. Henry didn't have an air filter. And if you put one on, it just restricts the airflow. I found no problem running without one. They do make aftermarket ones that they put on there. But again, a deviation from Henry, it just causes problems with adjustments other places. Have to, have to adjust for the restriction of air. Adjustments are very simple. This is a screw that you adjust it with. All that does is adjust the idle, cir idle circuit. Everything else inside is, is just the way that the thing is made and put together with a series of jets, much like modern carburetors. Idle adjustment, it's your throttle, runs your foot throttle from inside. This is the choke I talked about. And when you turn this rod, it actually adjusts the amount of fuel that's going into the carburetor. Very simple. If you're a basic mechanic, they're very easy to work on. Everybody that I know that has a little mechanical knowledge has found that these cars are, are just a pleasure and kind of fun to work on because you can actually fix it yourself, diagnose the problems and get through it. Uh, this also has a rumble seat. That's uh, sometimes called a mother-in-law seat and I'll let you figure out why that was. Okay, this is the rumble seat. Closed, it looks just like the trunk of the car. And if the car has a trunk, this is the same lid simply turned around and the handle is at the back and the hinges are on the top and it opens up like a modern trunk. But the rumble seat was a nice feature that you could put two more people in the car, two more passengers. You got in through a couple of steps over here and stepped in, you had to step on the seat. It's not pretty to get into it, but it's fun once you get back there. Now, this is a small car. Model A's, Model T's, they were much smaller than the modern cars are today. You probably have two people back here. Now, I don't know what some of the people did riding back here, but I do know when I'm at a car show, and some of the older ladies come around and they step up and look at this rumble seat. They get a real silly little grin on their face and I think they're reminiscing about some of the things that might have happened back here. So I'm much too young to know about any of that. So, But the reason you rolled the back window down was twofold. One, it lets some air flow through the car for the passengers in the cab. It also allowed you to talk to the passengers back here. In the old days, they sometimes called this the mother-in-law suite, and they kept the window up so they didn't have to talk to her. 
but uh, of course I'd never do anything like that. All right, to enter the rumble seat, you place your left foot on the lower pad down here, grab onto the, the lid, step up, put your right foot on the fender on the pad, and then step up again. You'd have to step on the seat, get inside, slide down. Once you get in, it's kind of roomy, but uh, getting in there and getting out is a little bit difficult for some people. Was has a roll-down rear window, which was an option only in 1931 on the coupes. There were a lot of other body styles. There was what they call a Phaeton, was like a four-door convertible. A Roadster was a two-door convertible. They had side curtains, no roll-up windows. Uh, feature of this car it does have roll-up windows, which is very nice. It has a heater on it on the manifold which is uh, similar to what you might find on a Volkswagen if you ever owned one. It's just hot air blowing across the manifold, coming through a hole in the firewall. It actually works quite well. We've tested it in a number of conditions, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, my wife, Terry, also drives the car. There's a sticker on the window. She belongs to the Lady A's Model A Club, and uh, that's just a national organization of women to promote ladies driving the cars. A lot of the advertising was done showing women because they were promoting this. This is in the era when the horse and buggy was kind of falling back and the automobiles were taking over and they wanted nice features uh, like the roll-up windows and things of that nature but a lot of people still preferred the open car because it was cheaper. This car when it was new without the extra features on it was $495. It had electric lights all the way around, had one tail light, one brake light. Uh, as a feature later, it was encouraged, Henry Ford was encouraging the dealers to sell a taillight for the other side on the other fender. But the reason wasn't like we would think today is safety. It was because he wanted to increase the sale of bulbs for his friend, Mr. Edison. Sounds a little bit strange, but things were much different in those days. Turn signals were not used. You did arm signals. Probably learned how to do those when you rode a bicycle. Today, uh, most people have forgotten about them, so when you put your hand out the window and give a signal, a lot of times people just wave back at you. So I've added turn signals to this car for just safety reasons. Okay, I mentioned the lights on the rear. This is the one that came standard. It's a stainless steel case, glass lenses. This is a brake light, the large one. The small one is just your running light. When you turn on your headlights or cow lights, this comes on. This only illuminates when you put on your brake light. There was one on the other side as an option. But again, Henry wanted people to sell that for his friend, Mr. Edison, so they'd sell more light bulbs. You might notice this is a 1930 license plate. In many states, if you find a well-restored license plate, you can run it on the car, the same vintage as the car when it was new. This is a Pegasus, just an option. They used to have a lot of these things, insurance companies. Uh, this is a gas company. They were just little dress-up items that they gave out, and you put them on, you really do some free advertising for the folks. When I say safety, that's because this car has been driven quite a bit. Uh, we have personally put over 65,000 miles on this car. Uh, we've been in uh, 37, 38 states. We've been in three provinces, or maybe four provinces in Canada. And we have driven this from just south of Atlanta, Georgia, cross country, up through Canada on the Alcan Highway, the, the American-Canadian Highway, into Alaska, and then we took the Dalton Highway up to the Arctic Circle. Round trip, that was 11,609 miles, and we did it in 44 days. Had very little trouble with my car. One wheel bearing gave me a little bit of an issue, but uh, wasn't a big deal. We fixed it on the side of the road. My wife also likes to drive the car. Ladies can drive it very easily. Actually, she's much smaller than I am and fits better into the car. People were smaller back in the 30s than they are today. We have grown a little taller and we've gotten a little rounder too. Uh, the car was designed to do a maximum of 55 miles an hour, but the roads were such that you really couldn't do that. In 1930 in Georgia, there were only about eight miles of paved roads and that was probably in the major cities downtown. All the other roads were pretty much dirt, maybe some gravel, a little bit of this and that, but they weren't very nice. They were hard riding difficult to get around. Uh, we experienced that when we were in Canada on the Alcan Highway. Uh, it was also very rough. A lot of washouts, potholes, uh, damage to the road because the highway was made in World War II by the uh, United States Army 
and it's made of glacier soil and it's very unstable, so the hard winters take a lot of toll on the road. But we made it without any difficulty. The cars were made to take that kind of abuse. People said we would really ruin the car, and all we did was we maybe got a stone chip or two, but a lot of dust and dirt, but the car came back fine. It didn't, didn't hurt it a bit. The features of the car are simple, but improvements over the Model T. Like I said, the Model T was a very good utilitarian type automobile, and Henry made it for a long time and made many millions of those cars. This car was only made for four years, and it hit during the Depression era which kind of hurt the sales, especially in 30 and 31. So Henry had some problems getting this car out. He built a lot of body styles, had a lot of market out there, and a lot of people were interested in the car, but times were tough, not like we are today. We're very plush today, very lucky. But the car did, you'll see a lot of old movies during the Depression where these cars took, people took these cars and drove cross country with nothing but oil and water, and they made repairs. I read a story about a couple that left the Midwest going to California looking for work in the oil fields. When he got there, he did some major repairs. He repaired a valve and did some other things, but pretty extensive by today's uh, commonality of things to do to a car, and his parts cost him less than $5 to do all that. So money was tight, but parts were inexpensive if you had any money. Today, it's much more expensive. Every year, the parts seem to get a little pricier, but the Model A is probably the easiest touring car to own, repair, and get parts for. We travel with the Horseless Carriage Club, which is really a brass era car, but they're kind enough to let us in. But we're limited, we can't go on some of the tours that they do. We also belong to the Model A Restorers Club of America, and we have three chapters of that here in the state of Georgia, and we're affiliated with two of them, but friends with all of them. We have friends, sometimes we might take off and go see a friend in Alabama for lunch in these cars. It's not uncommon to go out and drive two or three hundred miles in a day and just really enjoy and come back with a nice big smile on your face. Okay, as I mentioned, this car has wire wheels. They're spoked wheels, a uh, very heavy spoke, and uh, they're there to design to keep the, the, the wheel straight, much like a bicycle, but they can't be adjusted too much. So if you bend a wheel, you need to go find another one. Wheels on the Model A Ford are steel wheels with spokes. The 28 and 29 models came with 21 inch wheels. The 30 and 31 are 19 inch wheels. These are 19 inch and I have a 475 by 19 inch white wall tire. The spokes are very simple. As long as they're straight, the wheel is straight. If they get bent, the wheel tends to wobble a little bit. The wheels were typically painted the same color as the pinstripe on the car but most of them in the early years came from the Ford in black and the dealer painted them for you. You see these kind of tires on really expensive cars, the, the really high-end cars. Henry designed his to have a single spare tire mounted on the back of the car. But this car has a luggage rack and a trunk on it which interfered with that so they were moved up here and also one extra one was added to the other side. And these stainless steel bands were also extra just to dress up in a trim item. They bolt on the same lug nuts and everything. You just unbolt it, pull it out, use it, put your flat tire back in here and hit the road. And fortunately, I don't have to use these very often, uh, but I have used them on other people's cars as well as mine. So when you're out with a group, you never know what to expect. This car has six wheels. It has two side mounts. Side mounts are where the spare tires are exposed and in the front fender. Uh, it came standard with just one on the rear but it's a kind of a dressy item. This car has uh, got a lot of extra chrome or stainless steel on it. This car in, in 28 and 29 came with chrome features. In 30 and 31 it was stainless steel, non-rusting stainless steel, which helps in keeping these cars alive. Most of the parts on this car are original to the car. There's been a few that have had to be changed over the years because they were damaged or just wore out. But the stainless steel is all original. We've had some friends of ours take and knock the little dents out. They repolish it and it looks as good or better than what Henry put out. Uh, features of the car, of course, no turn signals. Talked about that. Many people do add turn signals to the car just for safety reasons. Sometimes we improve the headlights. The headlights had 32 candle power. That's not real bright, it's adequate, but it's, you're talking about very slow speeds in those days. Today we drive a little bit faster, so you want a little bit better lighting. 
Okay, the lights on this car, I mentioned everything up here that's shiny is stainless steel. A couple of options I didn't mention, this is a stone guard. Behind that you see the black, that's the bare radiator. If you're driving on a dirt road, or just any place for that matter, something flies up, hits the radiator, it could do some serious damage. So this will protect you. I have ridden with people, we've hit birds, stones, all kinds of things coming up. The lights are electric and you do have a high beam and a low beam. It's adjusted from the steering column. The steering column has a position to the left for the cowl lights, which are back here. The next position is low beam and then high beam. It has a dual filament bulb inside. Now I have a little heavier bulb in it than what Henry put in it, so I can get a little bit brighter light and I can see running down the road. But the old ones did pretty good if you had them adjusted right. The key to these is adjusting them, and they're, they're a little difficult. You have to undo the bolt down here and get out and move it around and swivel it the way that you want it. I typically put a blanket over one and adjust one and adjust the other and hope that I've got it right. Mention the thermal quail. This is the thermometer right here. When it gets up in this little area here that's open, if it's in that spot, start worrying about it. Start wondering what's going on. If you're in a parade or something, it's not uncommon for old cars to overheat. That's why we don't like to be behind some of the slow-moving traffic in the parades, the people that are dancing and stopping, because when we idle, it gets a little difficult. Uh, we also sometimes add LED lights to these cars because of safety. The lights are small in the back and hard to see sometimes if you're using a standard because it's just a little six volt light. It's a six volt system. Today the cars are running off 12 volts. Uh, the difference is it's tar the starter turns a little bit slower. The lights aren't quite as bright. And the power system, a generator, doesn't produce a lot of electricity. So when you come up to a stop, your lights will actually dim down a little bit until you rev the engine back up. To start the car, you have a manual spark advance and a manual throttle, both on the steering column, a clutch and a brake, much like you've had, have still today. The starter button is on the floor. You have to reach your foot up and push the button down, let go of it when it's started. Then you adjust your spark and you adjust your throttle to where you want it. Also, it has a manual choke on the right-hand side of the dashboard that you pull out when you start the car. And usually that's enough. In the winter sometimes, and even in other conditions, you have to adjust how much gas you actually want to regulate in the carburetor. You take the choke rod and turn it left or right. That allows you to tell how much gas is going to flow. This is the steering wheel on the car. Fairly common. Uh, nothing special about it, but there's a lot of features around it. This is your light switch. Parking lights, low beams, high beams, and your horn. <laughs> Also, this is the spark advance I talked about. 11 notches, one for each five miles per hour. And this is a throttle control. This is an extra safety item. These are just turn signals, much like you have on a modern car today. In the Model A Ford, this is what's called the dashboard. Very simple. This is the gas gauge right here. You can see in here, if it's, it's got markings on it from full, three quarter, half, quarter, down to empty. Empty is a zero. You get close to zero, you're in trouble. But all this is, it's a wire mechanism on a half moon with a cork on the end. And the cork rides up and down with a level of gas, moves this half circle around to tell you how much is in there. And it bobbles around a little bit. And they say when you get down close to zero and it quits bobbling, you're in big trouble. This is a speedometer and an odometer. Works much like modern things but it doesn't have a needle, it's really a, a ball or a roll that goes around circular. The ignition switch is just on off. And an amp meter tells you whether your electrical system is charging or not. Good idea to keep an eye on that because if you're not charging, you're gonna be in trouble later on. Pedals on the floor is a clutch and a brake, same as we still use today. This is an accelerator right here and a footrest. It works the same, but it looks a little different. They have a long pedal today. This is the starter button up here. This is the gear shift. Just three speed, move it around any way that you want, any gear that you want to get it into. I said it's a three speed manual transmission with no synchronizers. That means between the gears, you have to shift slowly and double clutch when you put it in neutral. If you don't double clutch, many times you'll be grinding gears or it won't go in at all. Especially when you're downshifting. You have to regulate the speed of the automobile 
with the RPMs of the engine to get a nice smooth shift. And that's what you do when you're double clutching is you're feathering the accelerator, working your gear shift and your clutch at the same time. And this is what's called an emergency brake or a handbrake. It was called an emergency brake back years ago because if your brakes didn't work right or you were in trouble, you needed more braking, you pulled back on this thing in an emergency and it locked up your rear wheels. This is not a Model A part, this is an aftermarket overdrive system that I've put into the car. Gives me a little less RPM and a little more road speed. Because we drive it so far, it'll add a little bit of life to the engine. This is my defroster. It's a vacuum controlled by this tube right here. You just turn this and it thumbs on, turn it back and it goes off, but it blows air on my windshield. When it's really summertime, hot, humid, and rainy, the windshield will fog up and this will keep it so I can drive and see. Here we have the rear view mirror, which is a standard item in the car, but this has a clock in it. And it's a wind up clock. You have to wind it every day, just like an old watch. And if you take it apart and take the back off, you look at it, it's the same thing as a pocket watch. Some of them had a little pull change and actually ran for seven days. You pull the little cord down and it went back up and it wound the clock for you. These were kind of pricey uh, in the day, so they weren't in all the cars, but it's really nice for me today to know what time it is when I'm riding around because it's about the only modern feature I have in here. And as I mentioned earlier, standard on most of the cars is the windshield opening out. It's simply two arms, you unscrew the fasteners, lift the arms, and you can open it up. As I told you, the, get, the air comes in underneath the windshield, hits this dashboard right here, and pushes the air down on your feet so you're quite comfortable compared to a closed car. That really does add a lot of driving comfort to the, to the people inside. And we have the back window and the window shade. I mentioned the window shade with the lights in the car, when lights from other vehicles come through, hit all this flat glass, you get a lot of reflection. So you pull this down. It's fairly open and lights will come through so you can still see the, the cars behind you as far as their lighting, but you can see much better inside the car for driving. Then we have the roll down window. There's a little crank right here. You just turn this and it rolls down and you can talk to the people in the back you also get a lot more ventilation in the warm weather. It was kind of nice to have the people in the back so you could talk to them, especially if you have children back there, you can see what's going on and keep them in order. The gas tank is right in front of the windshield. It's right in your lap. <clears throat> Some people think that's not a real safe item, but I haven't found it to be too much of a problem. But the Model A has the gas up higher above the carburetor and it's gravity fed. So you don't have all the problems you had with the Model T with the gas tank being much lower. It holds 11 gallons of gasoline. Uh, I get somewhere between 20 and 25 miles a gallon when I'm cruising on the highway. Uh, not that much around town. It really depends on your conditions, much like today, how you drive the car. Talked about the gas tank earlier. Right here is the gas tank. This is the gas cap. Comes off, you fill it up, and you're done. Very simple, but it is right here in your lap. The braking system on Model A's was a four-wheel drum type brake. It's called a mechanical brake system versus later model cars had hydraulic brakes. The difference is the hydraulic gave you an assist in applying pressure to your wheels. In the mechanical system, it's all foot power. You have to supply all the power. The harder you push, the more braking you get. The internal parts are much like the brake drum systems used today. It's two drums running inside a, a round hub. And it's, if it's adjusted correctly, your parts are in good service order, and everything is up to, to par where it should be, this is a very good braking system. I would put it up against any hydraulic four-wheel drum brake system out there, assuming both of them are set mechanically correct. The drums on the car are just, or the brakes are just a standard drum brake. Use the same style of braking through the 60s and 70s, and some cars today still have that same braking on the rear wheels. But the modern cars have a hydraulic assist. This is strictly manual. What it is, it's a series of rods. When you push the brake pedal, you have to supply all the pressure for the brakes. Many people are uncomfortable with it, but I've found that 
If these are adjusted correctly, you have good parts and everything's in good service order, stops the car quite well, as well as any car would have probably in the 1950s and 60s. Again, the difference is you have hydraulic assist on the more modern cars, but this is a mechanical brake system. You have to check things on this. You check the oil probably every day when you're traveling. You check the water supply. You occasionally check some other things, transmission, rear end, and things of that nature. It holds four quarts of oil. There's no oil filter, and it's a simple splash pickup system. That means when the push rods come down, there's a little cup. In the oil pan, there's a tray. It picks up a scoop of oil, blows it up onto the bearing, and that's how it's lubricated. It has an oil pump, but it only pushes about maybe four or five pounds of oil pressure. So you're relying on that splash oil system. It pump, pulls it up to the top of the motor, pulls it back down, splash, and you push it back up. Very simple, very adequate. Most of it is, is keep your car serviced. The accessories that were added to this car, very simple. The quail was added, thermal quail. I don't know the exact cost of these back in the day, but they were a few dollars a piece, but they added up and money was tight. It has dual side mounts rather than the rear tire being in, this, in the back. It has step plates on the running boards, which just keep you from wearing a hole in a rubber getting in and out of the car. Another item is what's called a step pad. It's a dress-up item, but what it does is keeps people from wearing a hole in the rubber pad that's on the, on the running board. You'll see quite commonly a worn out spot down there and you get down to the rumble board itself, which is made out of steel, wear the paint off and it starts to rust. It's kind of pretty on the car, but it is a functional feature. But again, it was an accessory, did not come with the car. The rumble seat was an option. The roll down window in the rear was an option. Uh, has a luggage rack on the back and a trunk. And today we call the trunk the part that opens up and you stow things inside. In those days, the trunk was outside because the rumble seat was used to carry passengers. So you put your clothing or whatever you wanted inside of that trunk and you carried it along with you. All right, this is the trunk we talked about on the car. This is definitely an option. Because we have a rumble seat, have no place for luggage except for a little floor space. You start off by adding the rack on and you have to move your spare tire. And then you simply carry any type of items you want. These are all made by various people that have luggage and inside you just keep whatever you need. I keep spare parts, fluids, a few tools, first aid kit, and uh, you know, all the things I think I need to get up and down the road. It's a very handy item. You can also carry your clothes. That's what it was designed for. And you can get quite a bit in here if you pack carefully, but you gotta be, gotta be uh, very innovative on how you pack yourself when you go on a trip. Again, kind of expensive items in the day, but if you needed them and you could afford them, you put it on there. The old story about any color you want as long as it's black was really wrong. It wasn't, didn't apply to the Model A's at all. You could get quite a few different colors with it. You could get white wall tires, but a lot of these were done at the dealer. Sometimes people wanted a color, the dealer would paint it for them. White wall tires, most of the time or many times, were added at the dealership along with many of the other items. Dealers were full service in those days. They did everything. These are the cowl lights I mentioned earlier. Today you might call them parking lights, but it's really just to be seen, not to see. It's a single light bulb. It's adjusted again, turned on, using the steering column knob. Has a, uh, the carburation system is rather simple. It's a Zenith carburetor. It's an updraft carburetor, rather downdraft like they had in later years. Uh, it's a single manifold, single exhaust. The exhaust system is just straight through with a muffler in the center, but it's a unique shape. You'd have to see it. And that creates kind of a, an interesting sound for the Model A. It's, it's unique to this car, and it, when you idle it, it has a sound called Cadillacing, and we'll probably show you that later. But it was a term used, you make it Cadillac, and it just kind of went putt, 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 putt. It was a very slow idle, and you did that by reducing the spark advance, retarding it all the way, and it would do that. When you're driving the car, it's rather simple. You do mess with, the, change the spark advance slightly. If you're on a highway, you may retard a little bit on a hill, things of that nature, but pretty much you set it where you want it and go with it. It's got 11 notches. Each notch represents five miles per hour, which again is a 55 mile an hour car. We have the windshield that folds out. 
We have a sun visor on this. This was standard on almost all Model A's. A few of the later 31's did not have them, but almost all of them had a sun visor. Some of the late 1931's, called a slant window, did not. It was a common item. It was standard equipment. And it did just like I said. It kept the shade, the sun out of your eyes, shaded the sun some. It does make it a little more difficult to see the uh, stoplights. You have to kind of crouch down and look underneath. But without these, it's it, it really is, is kind of hard to drive the car in a bright sun. You come around the sides, we have rear view mirrors on the outside. Have two of them on this car. These are optional equipment. There's a number of ways you can put them on the car. These are mounted through the hinge. But you do need these to see traffic. Back in 30, there weren't a lot of cars on the road. You didn't have to be quite as careful looking around and changing lanes and things. Then we have the wind wings, another option. Some people have fancy designs in the glass and things. These are just clear glass. But it's designed to divert the air around the passenger when you have the windows rolled down. Makes it a lot easier. Without these, the wind tends to blow in your face and it gets kind of harsh after a while. It does a nice job of uh, diverting that air. Also, when it's raining in the summertime, you can have your windows down part way and it'll deflect the rain around the window as well makes it a lot more comfortable in the cab. One thing I forgot to mention is in 1930 and 31, Henry upgraded, upgraded the glass in the windshield to safety glass, a big step forward for safety. Before that, it was just plain plate glass like you'd find in your home. All the rest of the glass was still non-safety plate glass, but if a stone or something hits this windshield, it's the same glass that you have in your automobile today It'll crack or, or break, but it won't come through. Side glass breaks, it sh breaks in shards and really can be quite dangerous. As you can see, these cars were not designed with safety features like we have today. The bumpers on a Model A were very simple. They were simply straight stainless steel bars. In 2829, they were chrome plated, attached by a spring steel bracket. When I say spring steel, these actually were designed to absorb shock like the modern things do today, but very primitive because cars back then used to bounce together and when I say bounce, they actually bounce. You'd hit something that would bounce back. You didn't bend. They're very strong. They were common on all the cars, had two small bumpers in the back, a solid one in the front. I have heard that this was an option and I think maybe they charged extra for them, but I think all the cars had them, but I can't confirm that. This accessory is called a luggage rack. If you remember earlier talking about Model T's, there was no door on the driver's side. So this would accordion and stretch out the whole way and you'd load it up with suitcases and whatever else you've had. If you look at some of the old movies, you see chicken coops and many, many, many items in this. But it's quite different. We've choked this up, have as far as we can so you can still open the door and it still clears. But I put a small cooler in here so when we're riding around in the summer or the, or the colder or the hotter weather, we have some cold drinks to have with us all day long. Model T was a great car and they made them for around 20 years, but it just became outdated. Henry needed to move up in the world because the competitors were designing a lot of new things. And because Henry's T was so dependable, he wanted to stay with it as long as he could. When he came out with the Model A, they brought a lot of new features into it. It was a prettier car, a little bit bigger, maybe a little bit heavier. Less wood in the car, so it was probably safer. And easier to work on, I think. A little less confusing, and the things that are on this car were carried through for, geez, decades until they came out with electronics. So this car really is, is a, probably one of the best touring cars ever made because it's a very dependable car, gives reasonable economy, it's comfortable, and I've proven you can drive these things all the way across the country and further if you want to. Well, Ray, boy, that was real interesting and it sounded like you'd know all there is to know about this car. We appreciate you coming out on American Classic Heritage today. And listen, I want to caution you, be real careful while you're riding around out there because if something happens to Santa Claus, there's going to be a lot of people disappointed, including myself. So you be <laughs> real careful and thanks again for coming. <laughs> Beep! <laughs>